conventional wisdom suggests that the Earth is essentially a solid spherical mass, with an inner core of solid iron encased in a layer of molten iron, followed by stiffer mantle and the crust before heading to the surface on which we all live. However, although this theory is almost universally accepted as absolute fact, it is only an educated guess, with no solid proof to back it up. The fact is that we have never been anywhere near to the center of the Earth. So with that in mind, theories that state the Earth is in fact hollow and even able to support life should be treated the same way as the widely accepted aforementioned theory. As you might suspect though, most scoff at this notion and dismiss it entirely without any further investigation. However, throughout history, many prominent and respected minds, thinkers, and even military veterans have presented detailed theories as to what lies deep within our planet. When these theories are combined with the numerous reports and texts that make reference to living beings and entire civilizations that live and sometimes come up from inside the Earth, not only appear to warrant further study, but when viewed with an unbiased mind, suggest there may be more evidence to support the Hollow Earth theory than not. Both sides of the spectrum seem to agree that the moment of inertia of the Earth indicates that there's a concentration of mass around the very center of the planet, with further research along with seismic data appearing to show that this mass to be a solid sphere. Hollow Earth theories vary on exactly what the mass is, with some stating that it could be a magnetic core, while others suggest that it is a central sun. This is particularly interesting as modern science seems to suggest that the center of the Earth could indeed be as hot as our sun. In ancient times, Buddhists believed that the Earth was hollow and that it housed a race of supermen and women who would venture to the surface via tunnels. Buddhists even kept guards at the entrances to these tunnels to the inner Earth, said to be in Tibet. In other Tibetan, Indian and Hindu texts, an ancient kingdom called Shambhala is described, said to be located deep within Inner Asia, while other texts from India, such as the Ramayana, speak of the Avatar Rama, a great blue being from deep within the Earth. In the 1600s, as Western cultures were beginning to come out of the Dark Ages, where science and free thought was frowned upon by the Catholic Church, many scientists and philosophers murdered by the Church's heretics, there were prominent and influential figures who had come to their own conclusions about the Earth and if it was hollow or not. It should also perhaps be noted that although these thinkers were no longer forced to operate in secrecy under the threat of death, they were still kept a very close eye on by society's elites. Edmund Halley, perhaps best known for his discovery of Halley's Comet, was just one who theorized that the Earth was indeed hollow during this time. Using much of Isaac Newton's work on gravity to prove his theories, he claimed that the Earth was hollow and had a shell around 500 miles thick, had an innermost core, and was capable of supporting life. He went on to state, that an atmosphere filled the space inside the Earth and that the outer shell and the inner core both had their own magnetic poles that caused them to rotate at different speeds. Leonard Euler, a Swiss physicist, also proposed that the Earth was hollow during his time in the 1700s. Like Halley, he claimed that the Earth had a very thick outer shell, but at its core was a central sun. The sun, he claimed, provided heat and light for the inhabitants of the inner Earth. Interestingly, Euler went on to claim that the inner Earth could be accessed through huge entrances both at the North and South Poles. It's claimed by some people today that such applications as Google Earth have purposely attempted to hide these entrances, although there are some photographs that appear to show the opening that Euler claimed. As recently as the 1940s, there have been claims of an inhabited inner world, perhaps none more high profile than those made by Admiral Richard Byrd following Operation High Jump in 1947. 
Operation High Jump was a multinational effort led by the United States to establish a base at the North Pole. On the 19th of February 1947, Admiral Boyd led a squadron of planes over the North Pole. He claimed that he could see vegetation and animals that shouldn't have been there, and ultimately that he saw a huge opening that led inside the Earth. However, perhaps even stranger, Bird stated that out of nowhere there were strange flying crafts that got so close to them that they could see what looked like very similar to swastika markings on them. His airplane would not respond and he was essentially in an invisible vice grip of some kind. Bird went on to say that he was taken inside the Earth where he noticed great lakes and vegetation and that the inner Earth had an inner sun. He was greeted by the beings that resided there. They were, he claimed, concerned about humans in general, but particularly about nuclear weapons that were building up around the planet. Interestingly, there have been numerous UFO sightings in and around both nuclear power plants and on grounds where nuclear weapons are housed. It may be worth noting that there have been long rumors that Hitler himself had a keen interest in establishing a base at the North Pole, with the objective being to find the entrance to the inner world, believing that extraterrestrials or an advanced race would be found there. On the 5th of May 1947, the El Mercurio newspaper of Santiago, Chile, appeared with a headline article on board the Mount Olympus on the high seas in which it quoted Byrd saying, Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions. Furthermore, Byrd stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but it was a bit of reality that in the case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Like Euler 200 years earlier, he also claimed that there were huge entrances to the inner Earth at both the North and South Poles. He repeated these views several times, including at a press conference in front of the world's media, before he was hospitalized and ultimately forbidden from holding press conferences on the subject again. Burr died in his sleep in 1957, maybe predictably, maybe not, there were quiet claims of foul play, although his official cause of death was a heart ailment. Perhaps also worth checking out is Bird's son, Richard Bird Jr., who was six years old in 1947 and had accompanied and witnessed his father's claims. He was found dead mysteriously in a New York warehouse and had, by all accounts, had various trying times during his life. Perhaps the most interesting of all the Hollow Earth claims are those made by the Native American Hopi tribe, who have lived upon the plains of northern Arizona for thousands of years. According to their ancient writings, it was here that their gods instructed them to settle and build up villages in the rock, which look very similar to modern apartment blocks. Here, they were taught to grow corn, beans and squash, and thrived as a civilization. Key to the Hopi's existence was the ant people, who had guided their tribe safely during two cataclysmic events. In the first world, which was destroyed by fire, and the second world, which was destroyed by ice, the tribe had each time been guided by a strange cloud during the day and a moving star during the night until they came to the god-named Satu Knang, who in turn led the Hopi to the ant people. The ant people had lived on Earth since the first time and now housed themselves deep within the planet. They offered the Hopi safety until it was safe to return to the surface of the Earth and also taught them skills such as food storage, rationing, and how to sprout beans inside the cavern under the ground. Not only is this another reference to the Hollow Earth theory, but it also lends a certain amount of support to the ancient astronaut theory and the Anunnaki, the Hopi word for ant is Anu. Anu was a Babylonian sky god, the Anunnaki. Not only this, but Naki in Hopi means friend. Ant friend, Anunnaki. Coincidence or evidence? We should perhaps stress that not everyone agrees with that interpretation.
is the Earth spherical? Well, no, it's geoid, really which means Earth form. Because it's not a sphere, and because it's somewhat flattened at the poles, we also have oceans, mountains, plains, and other geographical features that give it a unique shape, which is called a geoid. But it turns out that there is certain data and some stories that give us the idea of a hollow Earth. That is, a land that is like a ball that has air in the middle, that is a shell of hundreds of kilometers thick, but hollow in the center. Here we will tell one of the most amazing stories about the hollow Earth. The hollow Earth was a concept proposing that the planet Earth is entirely hollow or contains a substantial interior space, notably suggested by Edmund Haley in the late 17th century. However, the notion was first disproven in 1740 and again in 1774 by Charles Hutton. But was these conclusions accurate? There are still many who believe the Earth has a vast cavern system below our very feet. On the surface, the Mammoth National Park in central Kentucky encompasses around 80 square miles, but underneath lies a twisted labyrinth of limestone caves, creating a network that earns the title the longest cave system in the world. Richard E. Byrd, pilot of the US Navy, flew over the poles, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, with a small Fokker monoplane, he flew over the Arctic, passing through Greenland, Kings Bay, now Nialesund, and Spitsbergen, Svalbard, reaching the North Pole. As for the South Pole, in 1928, he set up a camp based on the northern tip of Roosevelt Island in the Ross Sea, with laboratories, workshops, warehouses, a radio station, and a hospital. This base was the bird camp and his crew of 42 people for 14 months. Roosevelt Island is in the northeastern part of the Ross Ice Shelf. The ice-covered island off the coast of Antarctica is around about 90 miles long and 35 miles wide and was discovered in 1934 by Admiral Byrd himself. It was, in fact, a perfect location for all base camps. At last, on November the 29th, 1929, he flew over the South Pole. This expedition and three others in 1934, 1939 and 1955 made Byrd a well-known explorer of Antarctica. But here we're going to focus on something that Byrd never spoke about in public, about what happened to him on one of his trips to the Poles but we know from third parties that he found the entrance to the interior of the Earth. The entrance to the center of the Earth sounds almost like a bad 1950s sci-fi movie, but is there in fact any truth to this? Ariana and Agatha are the legendary kingdoms that is said to be located in the Earth's core. Though many remain skeptical, and rightly so, could Admiral Byrd's diary logs provide a tantalizing truth? So amazing, it's difficult to believe. Here we have access to his flight log about what happened on February the 19th, 1947. This would be an unofficial expedition, that's why it wasn't previously named. From his blog, we can read the following. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation in this writing. It may never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here so that everyone can read it someday. We're going to avoid log entries that talk about routine issues and we'll go directly to the substance. So registration begins at 0600 hours, six in the morning. 0900 hours, vast ice and snow below, yellowish coloration of nature is observed and dispersed in a linear pattern. Altering the course to better examine this color pattern below, reddish or purple is also observed. Circulating this area in two full turns, returning to the direction assigned by the compass, checking position again with the base camp and transmitting information about colorations in the ice and the snow below. O oh, nine ten hours. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We're unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there's no indication of icing. 0915 hours. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. It's no illusion. There are mountains consisting of a small range that I've never seen before. 0955 hours. Altitude change to 2,950 feet 
encountering strong turbulence again. 10 hundred hours, we are crossing over a small mountain range and still proceeding northwards as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05 hours. I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to a thousand feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. It's not the first time people have reported strange animals. Occasionally, reports do come in of people sighting dinosaurs and other extinct animals. Unusually, it's locations where humans are pretty scarce. If we take for an example the woolly mammoth, well, they were once thought to be legendary creatures. They weren't even identified as extinct species until around about 1790s, I believe. Could it be that Admiral Byrd witnessed some sort of aberration or experienced something more profound, like a portal or doorway to another reality? Report this to base camp. 10, 30 hours, encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp, radio is not functioning. 11.30 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seem light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God, off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They're closing rapidly alongside. They're disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They're close enough now to see the markings on them. It's a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We're caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our planes have stopped running, but the aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 11.40 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent, as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down only with a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I'm making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot towards our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering by name to open the cargo door. I comply. End of log. Some of these cabins can be huge. Of course, we don't believe we've probably discovered all these cabins which might be on planet Earth. We do know that vast systems like this do probably exist throughout the solar system. There's even rumours that there are vast cavern systems or some type of hollow area on our moon. So not only do we discuss the topics of hollow earth here, we're also discussing the topics of the hollow moon. Yes, it's feasible. Things could, like, could exist like that. And yes, there is probably room for a, a civilization to actually live under the ground. After all, ancient civilizations around planet Earth have lived under the ground in periods of time in our past, and they are visible by cave systems that go deep into the planet uh, and, and must have taken hundreds of years to construct. 
It's amazing what people can actually do, but is there a civilization hidden away in Antarctica? That's the biggest question that we face here, and I don't really know for sure if that could exist or not. If so, then it's something that has really been well kept secret. Maybe that we'll learn more as years pass, or excavations and exploratory uh, science missions go across Antarctica and we do get that information. One thing is for sure, there are many people that are coming forward uh, today utilizing Google Earth as a piece of software to identify locations of interest across Antarctica. And it is a subject which is very well much in the limelight at the moment, especially regarding whistleblowers which are coming forward and saying that they were part of a military operation and involved with locating underground facilities throughout Antarctica that clearly are not our own. If that is the case, then we have to really start thinking, could there be some truth to these uh, incidents? And was Admiral Byrd's diary logs actually real events which unfolded, which he made logs of? It's very difficult to know. But one thing is for sure, there's a huge amount of secrecy surrounding Admiral Byrd's diary logs. Where are they? And what was really written in them? It's really difficult to work out what's true and what's not here, but one thing is for sure, we have a huge mystery on our hand. Then, the Admiral describes from memory the following events because he could not register in his log moment by moment as he did up to this point. What follows is his conversation with whoever captured him. Bird and Howie, his radio operator, get off their plane, escorted by their hosts on a kind of flying platform without wheels and take them to a large room in a building that, according to his words, he'd never seen before in his life. In this room, they're invited to have a drink, a delicious drink, but not recognized by neither. Suddenly, a door opens silently and Bird is invited to go and talk with the great master. On this door, he could see some inscriptions that he couldn't read. This great master is an old man, but with delicate features, and he asked the Admiral not to be afraid that he needed to talk to him. The Master told Bird that he had been allowed access for being a good-hearted man and well-known in the surface world. This surprised the Admiral and the teacher continued speaking. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of Earth. We shall not long delay your mission and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those amongst you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. Antarctica has been a mysterious place for a long time with people claiming that they've seen all sorts of strange things from there. There was in the 1970s and to the 1980s people who reported seeing a very large black hole over Antarctica. There was in, one, in fact one satellite photograph that circulated the internet. However, it turned out that it was actually part of the actual photographic process and the arm of the, of the photographic uh, telescope which caused this round hole to appear in the middle of the Antarctic. Um, that was pretty much realised very quickly. However, it didn't stop people coming forward with conspiracy theories that there was a massive cover-up. There was a huge hole in the Antarctica where objects, flying discs and things would enter in and come out of. And of course, the governments of the world were keeping that very hush-hush. Truth of the matter is, um, there are some strange, unusual holes in, in Antarctica, caverns, systems, caves. 
could they be a place where, which are entrances to another world? Who really knows? It seems that Antarctica is well off the map for being a location where you can visit. It seems very difficult to find out any information about Antarctica these days, even though in the 21st century we all have access to computer and software systems which might be able to utilise satellites to find locations. There are still areas completely blacked out. We have to question why is that? In 1945 and afterwards we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There'll be no answer in your arms, there will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? Bird replied that no, he knew that the Earth had passed through a dark age previously. It's not a real surprise to find that people believe in ancient hidden cities around the world. We, we've already discovered ancient cities b before. We still know that there are some ancient cities which haven't been found yet, which we believe exist, such as the lost city of the Amazon. There are many places like this which researchers and scientists still continue to try and find. However, it does prove that, yes, we can hide such a thing like this in plain sight in some cases. What happens if something is underground? Well, that's literally not going to be found at all, especially in a region known as Antarctica, where prying eyes don't get a chance to see what's actually there. It is a complete lockdown location, and I think only people go in and out is military and science expeditions. Any of us living an experience like birds would go out into the world and tell our story without thinking that many people would think that we're crazy. Instead, Bird hid the message, keeping it to himself. Why did he do this? Well, simply because when he told the high commanders of the Pentagon, they ordered him to be silent. Even the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, was duly informed too. The Admiral, being a soldier, kept silent accepting the orders of silence in the name of humanity. What? Was Admiral Richard Byrd a visitor to the Hollow Earth? Did the Ariani, the inhabitants of the Hollow Earth, allow him entry? Does this mean that the inhabitants of the Hollow Earth can open doors or gateways to their domains? If we have to be partial, there are certain sources that say that his diary does not exist and that it is from the writer F. Amadeo Gianni, published in 1957, his book is called The World Beyond the Poles, where he tells the story of Admiral Byrd and that this story comes to light. There are, in addition to this document, many sources that cite the Hollow Earth, from the city of Erx in Argentina to the cave of Los Tayos in Ecuador. Not only would there be entrances to an underground world, but also a kind of entrance hall to the Hollow Earth itself. In ancient times, the concept of a subterranean land inside the Earth appeared in mythology, folklore and legends. The idea of a subterranean realms became intertwined with the concepts of places and origin of even afterlife, such as the Greek underworld. Even the Tibetan Buddhists believe that there is, in fact, an ancient city called Shambhala, which is located inside the Earth. If we believe in the Admiral's diary, the Ariani have been sending their UFOs called Flugelrads for years. They would bring their message of peace so that we take care of our planet, but then man attacks the UFOs, preventing them from delivering the message. So is there any new evidence to support Admiral Byrd's claims? It's been a long time since Admiral Byrd visited Antarctica, as you can well imagine. Well, there are whistleblowers that have come forward, as I've previously mentioned, who talk about coming across certain facilities that look to be advanced technology, look to be that they may have not been, been created by, by us. If that is the case, then that lends even new theories and new ideas about what is really going on in Antarctica. There is even speculation that numerous officials, presidents and astronomers and scientists had a gathering at Antarctica not too long ago. If that is true, then we have to ask the questions why? Was this some mass discovery that needed their input? It's interesting to note that there seems to be evidence to support that, that these people were around 
the Antarctica location at that given time? Why astronauts? Why scientists? Why presidents? It would suggest that something of major was discovered in Antarctica. And if that is the case, then could it have been this lost city? The lost city that Admiral Byrd claimed to have witnessed. Recall the case of the Battle of Los Angeles, a UFO of gigantic dimensions on February the 25th, 1942, flew over Los Angeles, generating alarm since the United States had entered World War II less than three months earlier. Was it a flugelrad sent by the Ariani to try to stop the Second World War and that it wanted to communicate with the high commanders of the United States? If so, obviously the dialogues between the Ariani and the humans ended before we started. Maybe because of this, we can never get in touch with the other inhabitants of our world. Newly released data from a European satellite has revealed the tectonic underworld below the frozen southernmost continent. Researchers have created incredible 3D maps of Antarctica's tectonic underworld and found that the ice has been concealing the remains of an ancient supercontinent's spectacular destruction. It's well known to scientists that the exact geological makeup of Antarctica's innermost land, located in East Antarctica, is yet to be discovered. What else awaits discovery in this mysterious continent? Antarctica today is divided into three distinct regions, East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and the Antarctic Peninsula, with each area containing a different topography beneath. The ice of the Antarctic Peninsula, for example, conceals a spine of mountains projecting northwest from the inside of the continent. East Antarctica, the largest area, includes flat plains as well as mountains. The Gambertsev mountain range is located here. Its mountains extend for 750 miles, with peaks rising above 11,200 feet, roughly the same height as the European Alps. This range is completely covered by over 2,000 feet of ice. The ground in West Antarctica is almost completely below sea level. The ocean bowl beneath this section was created during the last ice age, when the weight of the ice, which was considerably thicker at the time, pushed down on the bedrock. But what else lies beneath the ice on this enigmatic continent? In November 2018, news outlets around the world reported that incredible data about Antarctica had been obtained from a defunct European satellite. Launched on March 17, 2009, the Gravity Field and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer, the GOCE, was the first satellite of the Living Planet Program, which is the European Space Agency's Earth Science Program. It orbited Earth between March 2009 and November 2013, and its task was to measure the pull of the Earth's gravity more precisely than any mission before. Using data from that satellite, the researchers from Kiel University in Germany and the British Antarctic Survey examined Antarctica under the ice. Analysis revealed rocky zones known as cratons in the Earth's lithosphere, a zone between the planet's crust and mantle. Cratons are the core regions of most tectonic plates. The team also found Oregons, which are folded up regions of plates that are the precursors to mountain ranges. It's by studying the number of cratons and origins that scientists are able to compare the continental plates beneath Antarctica with other regions around the world. GOCE's newly discovered cratons are believed by scientists to represent the remains of ancient continents, and they reveal important information about how Earth's modern-day continents are structured, especially Antarctica. But data from the decommissioned satellite not only produced a global gravity map, but also revealed local gravity changes with a resolution as small as around 50 miles. Co-author of the study, Fausto Ferrocacoli, science leader of geology and geophysics at the British Antarctic Survey said, these gravity images are revolutionizing our ability to study the least understood continent on Earth, Antarctica. 
In East Antarctica, we see an exciting mosaic of geological features that reveal fundamental similarities and differences between the crust beneath Antarctica and other continents it was joined to until 160 million years ago. One interesting piece of information the team found was that East Antarctica is made up of old Cratons and younger Oregons. The researchers found similar structures to this in Australia and India. However, West Antarctica has a thinner and more homogeneous crust, which more closely resembles the southern tip of South America. The gravity map the team assembled from the data reveals that East Antarctica is made up of multiple cratons, which are the cores of long-lost continents. The scientists used data from other satellites to essentially strip Antarctica of its vast layers of ice so that they were able to focus on the bedrock beneath. When they examined this layer, the team found evidence of the continent's history as part of Gondwana, a supercontinent made of the modern Southern Hemisphere continents. The matching shapes of the coastlines of Western Africa and Eastern South America were first officially noted by Francis Bacon in 1620, at a time when Africa and the New World first became available to study. But the idea that not all the continents of the Southern Hemisphere were once joined in one great supercontinent was not put forward in detail until hundreds of years later. In 1912, by German meteorologist and pioneer of polar research, Alfred Wegener. He's remembered today as the originator of continental drift theory, which he put forward in 1912, suggesting that the continents are slowly drifting around the Earth. But Wegener also convinced that all of the Earth's continents were once part of a single great landmass, which he called Pangaea. Its name is derived from the Greek Pangaea, meaning all the Earth. Wegener proposed that Pangaea existed about 240 million years ago, but by about 200 million years ago, it began breaking up. Over millions of years, Pangaea eventually separated into pieces that gradually moved away from one another. These pieces slowly formed the continents we recognize today. Nowadays, scientists believe that several supercontinents like Pangaea have formed and broken up over the course of the Earth's history. These include Panotia, which formed about 600 million years ago, and Rodinia, a supercontinent that assembled around 1 billion years ago and broke up 750 to 633 million years ago. In terms of Wegener's Pangaea, Gondwana comprised the southern half of this supercontinent. According to plate tectonic evidence, the supercontinent of Gondwana was assembled by continental collisions in the late Precambrian, about 1 billion to 542 million years ago, and broke up around 180 million years ago. It eventually split into the landmass we know as Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, the Indian subcontinent, Madagascar, and the Arabian Peninsula. Even though the continent existed many millions of years ago, some paranormal researchers have put forward the idea that Gondwana may have been the original model for the lost continent of Atlantis, with the knowledge of existence somehow being passed down through the ages. Gondwana's formed into its final shape about 500 million years ago. By this time, primitive multicellular organisms had evolved as revealed by the rare fossils left from this period, which include segmented worms, frond-like organisms, and round creatures similar to modern jellyfish. When Gondwana represented Earth's southerly supercontinent, the planet was a lot warmer than today, and crucially, there was no Antarctic ice sheet. It was also a time, the Jurassic period, when dinosaurs still roamed the Earth, and huge areas of Gondwana were covered with lush rainforest. The first stage of the breakup of the subcontinent began in the early Jurassic period, about 180 million years ago. This new information contained in this gravity map gives scientists more knowledge about how the Antarctic continent was formed. But perhaps just as importantly, it tells scientists what will happen to it in the future. Antarctica is melting at a fairly rapid rate, and being aware of its underlying structure can tell us how this will happen and perhaps how it will eventually recover.
In December 2019, it was revealed that a new map of the mountains, valleys, and canyons concealed beneath Antarctica's ice had revealed the deepest land on Earth and would help predict future ice loss. The new NASA map, called Bed Machine Antarctica, collects together ice movement measurements, seismic measurements, radar, and other data points to assemble what is hoped to be the most detailed picture ever of Antarctica's hidden features. According to NASA's website, Bed Machine is a new Antarctic bed topography product based on ice thickness data from 19 different research institutes dating back to 1967, encompassing nearly a million line miles of radar soundings. Bed Machine relies on the fundamental physics-based method of mass conservation to estimate what lies beneath the radar sounding lines, utilizing highly detailed information on ice flow motion from satellite data that dictates how ice moves. Originally, NASA's bed map was a result of work led by the British Antarctic Survey, where researchers assembled decades' worth of geophysical measurements. In operation from 2013, Bedmap 2, like the original Bedmap, was a collection of three data sets surface elevation, ice thickness, and bedrock topography. One important discovery made by Bed Machine Antarctica was of previously unknown topographical features, such as the broad ridges that shield the glaciers flowing across the Transarctic Mountains, which separate East and West Antarctica. Bed Machine also discovered the world's deepest land canyon below Denman Glacier in East Antarctica, an astonishing 11,000 feet below sea level. As a comparison, the lowest exposed region of land on the Earth is the Dead Sea, which sits a mere 1,419 feet below sea level. The new NASA map is a vital resource that will help scientists predict exactly which areas of Antarctica are at highest risk of sliding into the ocean in the next few decades or even centuries, and which parts might in fact be more stable than previously thought. Who knows what else such Antarctica mapping projects might turn up in the future. Secret alien or Nazi UFO bases in Antarctica. It's an intriguing idea and popular with many ufologists. Now, whilst admitting that reality is often much stranger than fiction, which is this, reality or fiction? As always, let's take a look at the evidence. The notion that Nazi Germany had a secret UFO base in Antarctica is one of the most famous ideas associated with the end of the Second World War. Specifically, that a number of secret factions of Nazis escaped and set up a secret underground base to aid in the development of their top-secret flying saucer program. Such stories have been circulating for decades, adding uniquely to popular theories about alien visitors that remain a hallmark of modern UFO lore. This idea has had renewed attention during the past few years, thanks to widespread attention given to a 2006 discovery by Ohio State University scientists who found a gravitational anomaly located below Wilkesland, Antarctica. This has been interpreted by some as being the long sought after secret Nazi UFO base. However, it has turned out to be simply an impact crater with a typical mass concentration at its centre. It should be noted, firstly, that there is some legitimacy to the idea of a Nazi presence in Antarctica during the years leading up to World War II. In fact, the icy continent's strategic importance prompted an expedition by Germany between 1938 and 1939. This remains a significant contributing factor in the beliefs that the Nazis may have tried to establish a permanent stronghold at the South Pole. It is also well known that a variety of advanced aircraft had been designed by the Germans towards the end of the war, including suggestions that some of these resembled flying saucers. Though in fairness, no verifiable reports have been found that would indicate the veracity of the claims about Nazi flying saucers. In large part, the crux of the entire Nazi UFO affair has long remained centered around a device known as Die Glocke, or the bell. 
This was a conjectured Nazi weapons project, rumored to have been anything from some kind of experimental anti-gravity device to a special anti-aircraft weapon. Unfortunately, there's a lack of good source material about de Glocker that can help support the case that such a device ever existed. So what, apart from the expeditions carried out by Germany during the 1930s, might serve as the genesis of these legends about a Nazi UFO base in the southernmost polar regions? This notion actually has less to do with anything the Nazis did and instead appears to stem from a series of seemingly cryptic comments made by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd during an interview with international news service correspondent Lee Van Atter. It's important to interject at this point that Byrd was a highly respected American adventurer and hero known for his pragmatic and down-to-earth views and his proven extreme courage in the face of adversity. The interview which took place on board the USS Mount Olympus in 1947, appeared in the Wednesday, March the 5th, 1947 edition of a Chilean newspaper, El Mercurio. Admiral Byrd declared that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions, potentially using Antarctica as their base. He further stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was a bitter reality that in the case of a new conflict, the United States could be attacked by, quote, flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. As one can see, such wording easily lends itself to the idea of a connection between the Nazi UFO myth and something going on at the South Pole. What kind of perceived threat prompted Byrd to make such claims during the interview? Had some kind of danger actually existed in the southernmost extremities of Antarctica just after World War II? And if so, what was the nature of this threat? And could it have been associated with the technological carryovers from Nazi Germany, as some UFO researchers have already speculated over the years? Byrd had been tasked with leading the ill-fated Operation High Jump, which occurred between late 1946 and early 1947 and involved an extremely heavy military presence. Hence, some in UFO circles have gone so far as to suggest that Byrd's Operation High Jump represented a secret battle between US forces and a group of Antarctic residents with advanced Nazi UFO technologies. After all, what else might have sent Byrd and his scores of ships and aircraft packing so quickly? terminated six months earlier than expected after embarking upon this extensive and extremely well-funded military expedition. The theory about Nazi UFOs would also seem to explain Byrd's cryptic warning. However, on the contrary, it seems that what Byrd was actually discussing was the threat of an enemy nation getting to Antarctica and establishing military bases there before America. In fact, although details about it remained undisclosed for many years, the establishment of strategic bases had been precisely what the American presence during Operation High Jump had aimed to do. And, as regards the brevity of the expedition, rather than bumping into secret Nazi bases and their armaments, Byrd and his company encountered a relentless and unconquerable enemy, Mother Nature. The brutal conditions during that winter had been creating huge problems. In one dramatic instance in January 1947, a sudden downwind managed to sweep a helicopter mid-takeoff directly into the ocean, leaving a narrow window of opportunity for the pilot to escape the icy waters and be rescued. There were plenty of other situations, however, where the servicemen involved weren't as lucky. Complications resulting from extreme weather conditions led to the loss of several lives during the short period that Operation High Jump was underway. Operation High Jump was terminated the following February solely because of the worsening weather. Returning again to Byrd's cryptic statements given to El Mercurio, there was no need for an enemy aircraft, standard or exotic, to be present at the time of Operation High Jump to validate Byrd's commentary. Because by the end of World War II, experimental jet engines were already in development, and within a few short years, planes that incorporated such technology would eventually revolutionize both military and commercial aircraft. 
Admiral Byrd would certainly have known about this and spoke of the expectation that any military with a permanent presence in the South Pole might be able to use this strategic location to launch these aircraft that could reach any place on Earth within just a few short hours. No wonder he was concerned. There is another factor worthy of consideration here. Had Byrd's statements about lightning-fast flying objects been somewhat exaggerated too? Antarctic explorer Paul Sippel noted of the famous El Mercurio interview that the reporters aboard the USS Mount Olympus had somewhat overblown claims from Byrd's earlier expeditions in the region relating to the so-called Bunga's Oasis, a lake found to have uniquely warm temperatures, about 30 degrees centigrade or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, containing a variety of algae. Byrd later described the location as a land of blue and green lakes and brown hills in an otherwise limitless expanse of ice, and that his crew had seemed to have dropped out of the 20th century into an ancient landscape where land was just starting to emerge from one of the great ice ages. Bird would later call the discovery by far the most important of the expedition so far as the public interest was concerned. No doubt this led to speculation. Paul Sippel went on to say, the 11 press representatives aboard the USS Mount Olympus had fired off dispatches to the outside world describing the oasis as a Shangri-La, implying that it was warmed by a mysterious source of heat that might be supporting vegetation. Bird is claimed to have written in his so-called secret diary, beyond the mountain range is a valley with a small river. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Bird continues, saying that he can see animals in the valley, among them a living specimen of a woolly mammoth. This no doubt helped fuel other claims associated with Bird's expeditions, namely that they had discovered a habitable region at the South Pole, wherein a cavernous entry point into the Earth had led them to meet residents who existed below ground, the so-called hollow Earth dwellers, and took him to meet the Master, who said to Bird, we shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time that we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity. But now we must, for your tampering with a certain power that is not for mankind, namely that of atomic energy. A wonderful story, but unfortunately the secret diary has been definitively shown to be a fake. Taken into context, the embellishment of such details by the press could easily have served as the root of claims about not only a prehistoric oasis at the South Pole, but also the flying craft and eventually a secret Nazi base. Again, it seems likely that Byrd had been making a general statement about the potential uses of enemy aircraft during the coming decades, in the sense that a hostile nation, should they ever establish a base at one of the poles, might use the area as a centralized point for launching attacks against the US mainland. Indeed, Byrd had previously suggested that the US might wish to establish such a base at the North Pole. Hence, it seems clear that he viewed the polar extremities as militaristically advantageous locations. Finally, Byrd's phrase, in the case of a new conflict, seems to further indicate that his statements dealt not with any existing menace, but instead with the potential for a future threat by an enemy nation. With World War II still fresh in people's minds, many at the time shared concerns such as these. All speculation aside, what we are left with is very little ground for believing that Operation High Jump ended prematurely due to the presence of hidden subterranean races, attacks by woolly mammoths, or even Nazi flying saucers. 
Few would argue, however, that the various grains of truth pertaining to birds' historic operations have seeded themselves in the fertile grounds of myth and speculation, taking on a new and fascinating life of their own throughout the past several decades. One of the most significant researchers in this area is Micah Hanks, the author of Magic, Mysticism and the Molecule. In his book, he presents his investigative analysis of ancient magical practices, mystical states, and out-of-body encounters through altered states of consciousness. Micah also explores stories of mythical animals and lands, and critically for our consideration of Operation High Jump, secret advanced technology. Micah is fascinated that there continues to be growing interest in Antarctica and the talk of secret meetings being held there by US presidents, astronauts and scientists. One of the more recent discussions circulates around the discovery of an ancient civilization buried beneath the ice, a civilization that had a complex society. There have even been claims of frozen pyramids, photographs of which were published on the internet a few years ago. Dr. Mitch Darcy, a geologist at the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam said, the pyramid-shaped structures are located in the Ellsworth Mountains, which is a range more than 400 kilometers long, so it's no surprise that there are rocky peaks cropping out above the ice. The peaks are clearly composed of rock, and it's just a coincidence that one particular peak has a pyramid-like shape. By definition, it is a nun attack, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or ice sheet. This one has the shape of a pyramid, but it doesn't make it a human construction. Pyramid-shaped peaks are very common. The Matterhorn in the Alps and Mount Bullanstindrath in Iceland are notable examples. Though there are many hard facts here, they do not deter the hardline theorists. They continue to believe Antarctica is the home of a number of secret bases, when in reality there's no advantage in having a secret base in Antarctica because if there were, the world's governments would already have had a very public fight over it, and there is no evidence of that at all. Seemingly, all the South Pole is rich in is natural diversity and scientific opportunities, and long may it stay that way. Antarctica remains the last fully unknown area of land on planet Earth. Buried under thick sheets of ice, we can only guess what secrets might reside beneath. Perhaps because of this, there are many conspiracies and rumors that swirl around the icy continent, many of which revolve around UFOs and an extraterrestrial presence there, one that various governments of the world may even be aware of. Maybe the best place to start would be a brief recall of the claims surrounding Operation High Jump, United States-led operation which took place in early 1947 as they looked to establish a research base at the South Pole, at least officially. According to some research, following the transplantation of German engineers and scientists to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip in the aftermath of the Second World War, they had learned of an already established base of the Third Reich in the frozen world of Antarctica, a base incidentally that also had an alien presence. With an apparent cover story of wishing to establish a research base in place, the operation was led by highly respected naval officer Rear Admiral Richard Byrd, and it would be Byrd's own writings and testimony that would seemingly reveal the real reasons for the mission. On the afternoon of February the 19th, 1947, Byrd took to the skies for a reconnaissance flight over the frozen continent. However, according to his diary notes, flight entries and press conferences he would give in the days and weeks following the flight, instead of seeing thick, rugged sheets of ice, he found himself looking down on lush, green vegetation, as well as mammoth-like beasts and other animals that he claimed shouldn't have been there. He would elaborate that he found himself looking at a huge opening, and that when he followed it, he found himself inside the Earth itself. It appeared he was flying over a huge city as he entered a mammoth cavernous opening. Then, things turned even stranger. Bird claimed that something took over his plane, while at the same time, a voice came over the radio bidding him welcome. It had, he recalled, a strong Nordic or German accent. 
He further noticed several round circular shaped objects approaching him. His plane was brought to land on the ground and several tall blonde haired men approached his plane. His last flight note declared that a voice from outside his plane was ordering him to open the cargo doors. According to what he would later tell the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio, he and his men were accompanied to a large building where they were served drinks unlike anything they had previously tasted. He then claimed to have met with representatives of a race that resided in the inner earth. They told him that they had been allowed to enter unharmed as they were aware of his noble character. He would further reveal that the atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima had created concern among their kind regarding the human race, and that they now felt compelled to intervene should such an event appear likely in the future. Perhaps most alarming of all, particularly in light of his statement that the inner race felt compelled to intervene in human affairs, was his claim that the United States military had to prepare for attack from objects that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Whether we should take Bird at his word or treat his claims with a pinch of salt remains open to debate. It is perhaps interesting, though, that he was hospitalized only days after his press conference and what's more, despite his renowned reputation, he was never again allowed to speak publicly about his experiences again, at least in an official capacity. In his writings around a decade later, Bird would write that he had been ordered to remain silent on his encounter for the sake of humanity. While the claims of Richard Bird were one of the first mysterious events surrounding Antarctica, one of the most recent is no less mysterious or thought-provoking. It occurred at some point in the late 1990s or early 2000s, deep below the Russian research facility Vostok Station. It had long been suspected by scientists that a great lake of water flowed below the ice since the base had been first established in 1957. The presence of the vast lake under the sheets of ice was finally confirmed in 1993 after three decades of tests and experiments by both Russian and British scientists. What is further interesting about Lake Vostok is that scientists believe its environment is very similar to that on Europa, one of the main moons of Jupiter, and a celestial body that many believe could well harbor life. And it didn't take long for the scientists with an interest in studying Europa to turn their attention to the lake under Vostok station. It also didn't take long for conspiracies and alleged leaked documents to find their way into the public domain. The general thrust of the claims are that a secret and ultra-specialized elevator was painstakingly installed through the thick ice and eventually down to the environment below, including Lake Vostok. What's more, according to a whistleblower testimony from someone who claims to have worked on the project, Dr. Anton Padalka, who had sought sanctuary in Switzerland after allegedly abandoning the operation, they found a lot more than they were expecting. Padalka claims the team discovered a 14-armed octopus in the waters of Lake Vostok. This octopus was unlike anything they'd previously seen, with the glass octopus being the closest comparison. According to Padalka, not only did this being seem to have superior intelligence to a standard octopus, it could paralyze a person with its venom from 150 feet away. Even more remarkable, it had the ability to change its form and mimic a number of other aquatic creatures. By the time the research team had realized it could also assume the form of a person and mimic the crew, it was too late to save one of the biologists from being ripped to pieces by this apparent alien life form. It was eventually captured, whereupon Russian military officers arrived at the base and confiscated it. Its whereabouts now is unknown, but rumblings among the crew were that these would be attempts to weaponize the alien DNA of the unsettling aquatic alien, which would ultimately lead Padelka to publicly reveal what he knew. There have, of course, been further claims of bizarre and suspicious goings on over Antarctica as the 2000s have unfolded. Many people have claimed to have spotted anomalous facilities and even crashed UFOs using Google Earth, for example. And while some of these are more convincing than others, they are all intriguing. Without a doubt, one of the most thought-provoking and unsettling claims of unusual activity involving potentially alien bases in Antarctica actually made the pages of the tabloids in 2016 following the claims of archaeologist Jonathan Gray. 
Gray would state that he had in his possession video footage filmed in Antarctica by an American television crew from California who had been missing since 2002, a short time after the footage had been recorded. Gray put forward that video showed spectacular ruins of the frozen continent as well as an intense American military presence. What's more, this unit themselves appear to be engaging in archaeological activity at the site of the ruins. For their part, the military in the region denied any such activity or knowledge of the missing television crew. Gray, however, insisted there was a massive archaeological dig, taking approximately two miles beneath the icy surface, and more importantly, the United States authorities were using every power they could to block the airing of the video as it would clearly show this. What does this mean for the claims of Richard Byrd? Was his revelation more accurate and authentic than many people give him credit for? And has the human presence in Antarctica since the end of the Second World War not been one of purely scientific research, but one of using research as a shield to protect the few praying eyes that are in this part of the world from witnessing discoveries and revelations that would not only change human history, but possibly alter our own collective future. And above all else, just what are the ruins of these great cities? Who live there and when? Might we find one day that beneath the icy blanket these cities are the ruins of Atlantis? Might the disaster that overtook the legendary civilization have been part of a pole shift that sent the continent suddenly hurtling across the Atlantic to the southern regions? Might the presence of this advanced alien civilization, Atlantean or not, explain the alleged pyramid of the enigmatic continent that resides near the United Kingdom-owned Princess Elizabeth Station? All of this is speculation. Of that there is no doubt with speculation that is surely warranted for such a mysterious, protected, and off-limits to most location, and speculation that will continue for the foreseeable future or until the secrets of the seventh continent are revealed to all.